Hey guys, today I want to show you some radical, groundbreaking evidences about ancient India and its technology. Here's a carving found in an ancient temple. It shows something mind-boggling, a sperm approaching an ovum just prior to fertilization. But this sounds nonsensical because we know that the human fertilization process was only discovered in the 19th century. But this ancient Indian temple was built more than a thousand years ago. So how could they carve a sperm and ovum looking like this without a microscope? Of course, some will argue that this is something else, a snake eating an egg. Some will argue that this is Rahu from Hindu mythology. He is known for eating the sun or moon, causing the eclipse. Quite an interesting story from Hindu texts, except that this explanation conveniently avoids telling you that Rahu is only half snake. His entire upper torso is always shown human-like with full facial features. Here is another carving from another ancient temple. Again, this is clearly a sperm fertilizing an ovum. This is how it originally looked in the last five years, and the temple has decided to paint it recently. <laughs> Sorry it looks like this now. I like the older look. And one detail of this is that you can see that the sperm is smaller and the ovum is larger. If this is a snake, there's no way it can swallow this. If you look at the actual videos of uh, snakes eating eggs, you will not even consider this as a possibility. And this is not even a snake because it doesn't have any head or scales. If you notice Hindu temples, they carve the details perfectly. They carve the scales, they carve tongue, they even carve rows of teeth inside their mouths, which most of us today don't even know they have teeth like this. If this is in fact a sperm and ovum, and ancient India was far ahead in advanced technology, shouldn't they have documented what happens after fertilization? In another ancient temple, you can see something even more strange, a single cell. This is unmistakable because it looks circular, like an egg cell with a round nucleus at the center. So what happens when a sperm unites with this egg cell? A new life called zygote or embryo is formed and it starts to divide rapidly. The fertilized egg starts to split into two cells. Again, this is clearly shown in the same temple in the same place. Then it starts to split into four cells. Again, this cell division is also clearly shown in the same temple side by side as though they're giving us a step-by-step -step explanation of the process. Then the cells start to become a blob and slowly start to look like a human after eight weeks. Now this is called a fetus. Now thus far you have definitely wondered, is this all true? Or is this something else? If this is really true, if they studied the fertilization and cell division, then there should be carvings of fetus inside the womb, right? In a temple called Kundaram Bhairava Temple, there are carvings showing fetus with the umbilical cord attached, clearly in a fetal position, just like how we are able to see them with advanced technology now. There are other carvings showing stylized form of the human fetus as well. I have personally visited this temple to film this. However, I was told that photography has now been banned. But I've seen them with my own eyes and confirmed that these carvings are there in the temple, um, but the pictures I'm using are from the internet. But this is not the only temple which shows the fetus. In another ancient temple, in the village of Sirukarumbu, there is a weird carving. Again, it shows an unborn baby, a fetus inside the womb, in the fetal position. These carvings of fetuses are found in several ancient temples. 
but this carving gives us some spectacular details. It was originally said to be in the main chamber of the temple, and it has a hole on top where a specific concoction will be poured inside as a ritual, as though they're nourishing the fetus. Now, what is more interesting is that the main chamber of every Hindu temple is called Garbhagriha in Sanskrit language and Karuvarai in Tamil language. Both these words mean one and one thing only, uterus or womb. Why would a temple central chamber, the sanctum sanctorum, be called the womb? How is it related to pregnancy? I haven't fully understood this yet, but Hindu temples seem to be very closely related to pregnancy. I've shown you what happens inside the body, but what happens outside? Is it carved in Hindu temples? There are thousands of carvings showing pregnancy in Hindu temples. In fact, with the data I have collected, I'm now able to even classify them. This is between zero to three months uh, or the first trimester, somewhere between three to six months or second trimester. And lots of carvings show the last trimester because it's the most eye-catching. But Before we go look at the delivery and other interesting information, when a woman got pregnant in ancient times, how did they confirm if she's pregnant? Today, doctors do an ultrasound by putting a device on a woman's belly to see the baby and its developments. This is considered the pinnacle of technology. However, a very similar carving is found in an ancient Hindu temple in Cambodia. Here, a doctor is seen holding a very similar device on the belly of a woman doing the exact same test, checking for pregnancy. Archaeologists confirm this carving is more than 900 years old. Is it possible that such a device existed in ancient times? Are we inventing new machines or are we simply reinventing ancient machines? But how was such a technology possible in ancient times? Did ancient people at least know about human anatomy? It is well known that ancient builders carved things very accurately in Hindu temples. Look at the toes and look at the fingernails and their attention to human anatomy is just stunning. You can see the veins, arteries, and individual strands of hair, all of them carved in ancient times. Okay, I know some of you will think this is what artists do. These guys were master sculptors and they just wanted to show these details because they wanted to be accurate and love their jobs to make things look realistic and beautiful. But how beautiful is this? Currently placed in the Museum of Allahabad, archaeologists confirm that this is an ancient artifact, a model showing the intestine of a male human body. Experts have dated this to 2nd century AD, so it's about 1,800 years old. This was absolutely not done for beauty. They were definitely studying human anatomy for scientific purposes. Is it possible that ancient Indians were not only studying anatomy, but were also performing surgeries just like today? In the past decade, a revolutionary device has been created to detect breast cancer. It's a handheld cup-like device, and it can be placed on the breast to check for cancer. Remarkably, in an ancient temple, the exact process is carved. A woman is holding a cone-like device on her breast, clearly pressing it against her breast. She holds one finger on her face, a clear indication of thinking about her future, and tears are rolling down her eyes. Is it possible that this was an ancient, handheld, cancer-detecting device? How else can we explain this carving? 
exactly how advanced were they? Since we can see carvings of sperm and ovum, the cell division and even ultrasound tests for pregnancy, did they also study and use other advanced technology? Believe it or not, in the ancient temple of Sri Rangam, I found a very strange carving. A woman is holding up her leg to facilitate a man who is implanting something into her womb. Initially, when I was filming this, I thought she was delivering a baby. But look, her belly is completely flat and her face shows no pain or happiness. So she's not delivering. She's not even pregnant. So what is being implanted inside her womb? The answer is found in the ancient text of Mahabharata, which explains the curious case of Krishna's brother. After fertilization, an embryo was taken out of Krishna's mother and then implanted in the uterus of a surrogate mother. Today, this process of inserting an embryo in a different womb is specifically called gestational surrogacy. Until the last century, this would have sounded like magic. But with our technological advances, we cannot help but wonder, did ancient people use a similar technology? How else can we find such a carving with precise details and the matching description in an ancient text? Compared to his brother, Krishna's birth was only moderately complicated. His mother did not deliver him naturally. So they had to do a cesarean or a C-section surgery. The ancient text describes this surgical procedure as Shalya Prayoga. And the mother's belly was slit open to bring Krishna into the world. Even today, in Krishna's birth town, his birthday is celebrated in a very unique way. They will make thin cuts in a cucumber and show baby Krishna coming out to remember how he came into the world. While modern experts claim Krishna as a fictional mythological figure, many Hindus believe Krishna existed just like Buddha. Even outside India, for example in Cambodia, Krishna's mother is still revered as the godmother in Cambodia. You can find lots of thousand-year-old carvings, but carvings of her may be a little too accurate. Can you see the problem here? Yes, those three lines at the bottom of the belly, identical to the marks created by a modern C-section. Some of you may think uh, these are stretch marks caused by pregnancy. But stretch marks are vertical, not horizontal, and you should find them all over the belly. However, C-section marks are horizontal, and these marks are shown only on the lower abdomen, clearly portraying C-section delivery. How did sculptors know how to portray Krishna's mother with these marks if they had no knowledge of C-section? In fact, this mark is shown in many carvings of devatas or godmothers around many Hindu temples. This means in ancient times, C-section surgeries must have been as common as today. Okay, so we have seen ultrasound, mammogram, embryo transfer, and C-section. I know you're dying to know if they had test tube babies back then. If you're not familiar with test tubes, Today, an embryo is made outside the womb in a test tube or a container. This process is called in vitro fertilization or IVF. And yes, in ancient Indian texts, there are plenty of examples of test tube babies. For example, the popular ancient Saint Augustia was a test tube baby. He was fertilized and completely grown in a container called kum or kumbha. But of course, you may think these are just modern interpretations, but there are ancient carvings showing baby Agastya being born out of a container. 
If you are watching this video between 2021 and 2035, you may think this is quite dramatic. You may think it's not possible to have a fully developed baby coming out of an artificial container. But if you're watching this video in the future, if you're watching this after 2035, you will have no problem with this because we would have already progressed to this level of technology. We will be having babies delivered completely outside the human body in an artificial womb. What I find weirder is that the ancient texts are so accurate. They talk about the problems that arise because of these artificial methods. For example, Augustia was very short. He was not the same height as others because of this test tube system. Today, it's well known that there is a possibility of multiple births when they use in vitro method. And ancient texts and temples describe this issue. They show twins, uh, triplets, and quadruplets are created because of artificial methods. Agassya himself had a twin brother. Also, uh, a twin brother and sister called Krupi and Krupa were created using the test tube method, and they were identical twins. And this is very strange because if the twins are male and female, experts have always maintained that they will not be identical. But now, Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane confirms that, yes, two sperms can fertilize an egg. And yes, you can have a boy and a girl looking nearly identical because of this. But what's really fascinating is that this process was understood and artificially produced more than a thousand years ago. We have ancient carvings showing this where two sperms are fertilizing one egg and these types of identical twins are created. You can clearly see two sperms approaching and entering a single egg. Did we once have a very advanced ancient civilization? Did it somehow get destroyed? But the ancient Indians were more advanced than what we are today, because today we fertilize the egg in a test tube, and then we implant it in the womb. But the ancient text of Mahabharata explains a fully functional artificial womb that can hold the baby until its birth. According to the text, there were sophisticated structures called krutakum, meaning containers supplied with life-sustaining nutrients. And the text even mentions that these containers were supplied with nutrients and the cells grew until they became fully developed babies. All of this is quite unbelievable until you realize that scientists have developed and tested fully functional artificial wombs now. Growing a baby completely outside the womb is now called ectogenesis. These artificial wombs have been tested on lambs and they're fully grown for four weeks and they develop a coat of fur. And scientists have confirmed that they have all parts of the body fully developed without any issues. If law permits, they can build a complete artificial womb for humans. Did ancient Indians also do the same? Did they take the sperm and egg and not only fertilize them, but also create these artificial wombs called kum to grow the embryo into fully developed babies? But how did that kum, the ancient artificial womb really look. In almost every ancient temple, inside the main chamber or the womb chamber, there will be strange carvings called kum. This structure is usually carved secretly in deep, dark places of the main chamber. So the lighting is never good when I film that. I examined this one from the ancient temple at Hampi, the kum or kumbum does not look like a regular container, but a very, very complex, sophisticated device. The bottom has a large oval chamber to hold the growing fetus. It has two handles or knobs 
attached to it on the left and right, perhaps for opening it if needed. It seems to be having two large tube-like structures attached on either side. And on the top, there is a cylinder attached. I shot this one in a different temple. Again, look at this comb. Remarkably similar to the one we saw before. Why are these strange structures carved in deep, dark parts of temples? What's more interesting is that the entire structure has a long cylinder attached on top, which seems to have a type of ventilation mechanism at the very top to supply oxygen. Modern scientists confirm that these are the essential parts needed for an artificial womb. It needs an outer shell with a chamber to implant and protect the growing embryo an artificial placenta to put the nutrients and oxygen in, and a way to transfer carbon dioxide and waste products out. Do you know scientists are building a tiny ECMO device, a device that allows blood to be oxygenated outside the body? According to this plan, the device will blend gases and oxygenate the fetus, and they will have artificial placenta to remove the carbon dioxide and the waste from the womb. This seems to be the exact design of the ancient comb as well. Remember, I showed you a temple before. In it, there are carvings of how cells divide. First, a single cell, then it becomes two, and then it starts becoming four. In the same temple, there is a comb carved there, and there you can see something fantastic. Inside the comb, you can see cells growing. It clearly shows how the cells are starting to divide more and more, and uh, the cells are growing in this comb. But it is this specific shape that surprises me. It looks familiar, doesn't it? Because you studied this in high school. This is the pistil, the female reproductive organ in plants. I mean, this is remarkable. Today, we know the pistil contains the egg at the bottom, and it will get fertilized when a sperm cell comes from the top and cell division starts to happen. But how can this be carved in a temple? We know ancient people were studying human anatomy, but were ancient Indians also studying plants and animals and how they reproduce? Here's a carving that's at least a thousand years old in a temple called Kediliapur Temple. The details are shocking. An elephant is trying to give birth, but it's being assisted by other elephants. Look how one elephant is using its trunk and pushing it against the pregnant elephant's belly, just like human beings do. And see how another elephant is holding the tail up to facilitate the baby elephant come out without any hurdles. Other elephants are waiting and watching to see if she needs more help. The baby elephant is eagerly coming out to see the world. Of course, we can't help but think, this is pure imagination, right? Do elephants actually help a pregnant elephant deliver her baby? I thought the same until I watched this clip. Here, you can see how they behave in the wild. There's a group of elephants helping the mother elephant deliver the baby. An elephant is even holding the tail up. This means that ancient people were studying the reproductive behaviors of animals. Now, look at the carving of a human delivering a baby, again found in an ancient temple. The woman is in standing position, the baby is coming out, and she is assisted by other humans. Very, very similar behavior between two species of mammals. If you had seen this carving before seeing the carving of the elephant, you would have had a completely different perspective. You may have thought these sculptors liked to carve what they saw in their society. But when you see them side by side, you cannot help but wonder, were they systematically studying and documenting the reproductive behavior of all animals, including humans? 
Today, scientists observe the behaviors of animals like rats, pigs, and chimpanzees. Uh, this is one of the fundamental reasons why we are able to understand the human body and mind better. Were ancient builders also doing the same? Were they categorically documenting these behaviors in carvings? Not just reproductive behaviors, all behaviors, including social and personal behaviors. For example, you can see carvings of monkeys sitting in a meditating pose. But this is pure nonsense, right? Because monkeys do not meditate. They don't have any consciousness. At least that's what we thought until the last few years. Now, look at this video. Here, you can see a monkey in a meditating pose. This is real. We don't know if the monkey is actually meditating or not, but they do sit like this sometimes. Now we realize these carvings are not showing some fictional or mythological stuff. These guys were actually studying the behaviors of animals quite well. Another way to put this is accepting that today's experts have not yet studied and understood the behaviors of animals fully. And with the advent of camera phones, we have learned more about animals in the last five years than what experts learned in the last 50 years. So why did they document the pregnancy and delivery of animals just like human beings? Why do scientists observe rats in labs today to improve the lifestyle of rats? No, they do it to improve human lifestyle. Is it possible that ancient people were also studying animals to make similar improvements for humans? Earlier, I showed you how an embryo was artificially placed inside a woman's womb. But there is yet another strange carving found in an ancient temple. Here, we can see a female who's maybe six or seven months pregnant, and there is a man standing beneath her. We can clearly see that this man is holding a cylindrical probe-like device. One end is inserted into her reproductive organ, and he's looking inside on the other end. His one eye is clearly placed on this end of the device. Today, we use the exact same technology, and this device is called a transvaginal ultrasound and it's used to check the heartbeat of the fetus, and gynecologists use this to monitor pregnancies with a higher risk. The only difference is, now, instead of looking directly using a lens, we place a camera and look at it using a monitor. So this is absolute proof of how advanced ancient technology was in India, especially in the medical field. Let's take a look at this ancient carving. It's just brilliant. We can see a pregnant lady and the baby is going to start coming out any minute now. Look at the woman's face. She's gritting her teeth. We can almost hear her grunts trying to push out the baby. Look at the clothes on the rest of the women. You can see them clearly. But for this woman, it's not there because she can deliver any time now. But you know what's really fascinating to me? She has a safety net between her legs. Look, if the baby suddenly falls because of gravity, there is a safety net to hold the baby and make sure the baby does not hit the ground. Now, the pregnant woman's arms are on the shoulders of two other females who are helping her push the baby out. But there is another woman, a doctor, thinking, See how they've shown a finger on her face, a classic expression of trying to decide the right course of action. Perhaps the baby is not head down. It needs to be turned. Here's another woman clearly holding some medicine to reduce the pain of labor. In modern terminology, we have an anesthesiologist reducing the pain, a gynecologist or an obstetrician 
to monitor the situation and a couple of nurses to ensure a smooth delivery. Archaeologists confirmed that this carving at Darasuram Temple was created 850 years ago. In a way, this is really funny because Western archaeologists used to look at carvings like this and used to comment that this is a primitive and a crude delivery scenario. Where's the bet? And why isn't the woman lying down? Why is she standing? Today, more and more doctors are recommending a standing delivery, apart from the obvious benefit of gravity to help the baby descend. They say there is better oxygenation of the baby as the veins and aorta are not compressed by the pregnant uterus. They also say the contractions will be more efficient, the labor will be shorter and less painful, and uh, fewer forceps, vacuum births, and other huge advantages if a woman delivers in the standing position. Perhaps... All we need is a different perspective to see the reality of our ancient past. We have been repeatedly taught that we are right now at the pinnacle of human development and ancient people were really primitive people. We are brainwashed right from the childhood with uh, television programs, textbooks, and even today's social media. What we have to do is look at the ancient evidences in a different angle because it's obvious that what we are taught in books does not match what we see here. It's clear that they actually preferred a standing delivery simply because it was a better method. The ancient people were just a little bit more advanced than us. And they have also experimented with women lying down. We do see carvings of lying on the back deliveries. And believe it or not, we even have depictions of complications. This shows breech delivery. You can see the baby is coming out with the legs first and head last. And what would have happened if there were complications, if the child is, say, stillborn? What if the child has come out, but it's not breathing and there's no heartbeat? In the ancient Hoysalesra temple, built at least 900 years ago, we can see something crazy. A doctor has a baby on his lap. The baby appears motionless as though its heart is not beating. The doctor has a strange dumbbell-like device in his hand and is pressing it against the baby's body. But look how they carve the details. It's placed on the left side of the baby's chest, exactly on top of the heart. Is he giving CPR to a stillborn baby? Do you know in the last few years, we have invented a groundbreaking, life-saving modern device called a cardio pump? Are we going to ignore how this state-of-the-art device also has the dumbbell shape? exactly like the one in the ancient carving. So you can see they were using advanced technology completely from start to finish, from the time before conception, all the way until after the baby was born. Technology was involved. But ancient Indians appeared to be equally superstitious they had many strange and barbaric rituals when a baby was born. But this is not just a thing of the past. India is perhaps the only country where the age-old rituals are still continued today, even after thousands of years. In remote parts of South India, babies are delivered by traditional doctors, these doctors have never been to school. They have uh, learned their techniques from their mothers who learned it from their grandmothers and so on. As soon as the baby is born, a strange ritual is performed. The doctor will take the umbilical cord and also remove the blood inside the cord and will keep it in a container. 
Then she will mix a secret ingredient and everything will be put into a small airtight vial called tayat. So where do you buy this vial, right? It's actually available in all the country stores which sell traditional items in South India. It costs like 50 rupees, less than a dollar. And some people buy this today and simply wear them thinking it has magical properties. They don't even realize that this is a container. You can open it on both sides and you can put something inside. It is actually quite a sophisticated vial and it is still called Tayat even after thousands of years. And the name Tayat actually means cut from the mother. Thai means mother and Atu means cut off. And what do you cut off from the mother? The umbilical cord. So the traditional doctor will store the cord blood of the umbilical cord inside this as soon as the baby is born. This vial will be kept safely by the doctor. On the 28th day after the birth, a grand ceremony called Aranyanam or Aranyan Kairu is celebrated. A waistband like ornament made of gold or thick black thread is tied around the waist of the baby. And this vial will be attached to this waistband as a part of this ceremony. As the baby grows, he or she will continue to chain the waistband because the thread has to become bigger. But they're not allowed to change the vial and they must keep the same old vial forever and attach it to their newer waistbands. This waistband ceremony is even mentioned in the oldest Tamil text called Tulkapiyam. So this weird ritual is thousands of years old. But in the last few centuries, when civilized people started to come to India, they were not amused at this barbaric practice. Saving the blood from umbilical cords of babies and making them wear this for life? Hindus were pictured as barbaric, ignorant, and superstitious. So most Indians gave up this practice and they don't have these vials and they don't wear this thread anymore, except in remote parts of South India. And then suddenly, in the last few years, there is a groundbreaking new technology called stem cell technology. If you go to a big hospital now for the delivery of a baby, doctors will ask you, do you want to preserve the cord blood of the baby? What is this cord blood? What is this stem cell technology? The blood from the umbilical cord. Now, experts confirm that stem cells are special cells found in the umbilical cord, and we can cure deadly diseases, including cancer, if we preserve these cells. So if a baby is born today and doctors preserve its stem cells, 50 years or later, if that 50-year-old man gets cancer, they can use his stem cells to cure him. Is it possible that ancient Indians were also using the same technology? Did every person carry their own stem cells in these vials? Think about it, even historians agree that ancient Indians, like Cholas, traveled thousands of miles and conquered distant lands. If a person gets injured or gets a grave disease, what better place to retrieve the stem cells? He must, of course, carry this with him at all times. The full ancient system and knowledge must have been slowly destroyed over a long period of time. Even the traditional doctors know very little now. But even today, if the person gets bit by a poisonous snake, for example, they will open this vial, mix it with milk, and it will save the person's life. Even these doctors think it's some kind of magic as the knowledge of the ancient stem cell technology is lost. Of course, some of you will say, well, stem cells must be in a freezer. So this is nonsense. 
Again, just be patient for a few more decades and scientists will come up with a totally new way of preserving them without freezing them. If the Indian government is smart, they should look into the secret ingredient added in the vial that may have the key to preserving cells. How could ancient Hindus possibly know about this? If they knew about stem cells, did they also perform cloning? We all know cloning is the process of creating an exact replica of someone just by taking one cell. In 1997, the very first successful clone was achieved. Scientists took just one cell from the udder of a sheep and then cloned it into an entirely new sheep and called it Dolly. Dolly looked no different from a regular sheep and lived for six and a half years. Now, scientists confirm that they can take a few cells from your skin and make an exact replica of you if the law permits. But the exact same process is mentioned in the oldest Vedic text called Rig Veda. In here, three guys, collectively known as Ribus, wanted to create a cow. So they peel a little bit of skin from the cow and then clone it into an identical cow. They were actually cloning it, but they do something that's even more interesting. They find an older man who could not remember things and had lost all his practical skills. So they bring back his memory power and he then remembers all his skills. Today, this process is called therapeutic cloning, specifically designed to resolve Alzheimer's disease. And scientists are now able to make elderly patients remember and regain their skills with this type of cloning. Are we really inventing new technology? Or did this exist in ancient times? If so, did they also work on DNA? Is there any evidence to prove this? Ancient Hindu temples are full of mysterious symbols resembling the double helix structure of DNA, not in just one or two sites. This symbol is nearly found in all ancient temples. In a previous video, I decoded one aspect of the Nagas, but it's nearly impossible not to think of DNA strands when you see this. Why were ancient Hindus carving this everywhere? But it gets more interesting because sometimes they're not just snakes. For example, this 11th century artifact is found in Bhopal Museum. Here, we can see two figures who are partially human and then their tails are tangled up symbolizing the DNA. Is it a symbol of DNA manipulation or genetic modification or something like that? Are humans purely a product of evolution or were we genetically modified at some point in time? Today, we're making new species like liger by uniting a lion and tiger. Were human beings also created or modified using this technology? Why do we see 3% of Neanderthal DNA in human beings? How did our DNA evolve dramatically? Was it modified artificially in ancient times, just like how we are making GMO or uh, genetically modified organisms today? How did human beings alone evolve to the level of reaching Mars while chimpanzees which have 98% of the same DNA, are still using sticks and stones. Here's an ancient carving. You can see a fish at the bottom. What is remarkable is that we can see a type of long twisted strand coming out of its mouth. And on the top, we can see a strange amphibian or a reptile-like animal emerging. Is it possible that Ancient builders are showing that amphibians and reptiles evolved from fish. What else can this be? 
But this is crazy, right? Because first of all, DNA is very, very tiny. The diameter of DNA is only about two nanometers. One nanometer is one billionth of a meter. And this is so small, you can't even visualize how small it is. For example, if you take one human hair, it has a diameter of 100,000 nanometers. So you can understand how small one nanometer is. So it is a wild claim to say that ancient people were able to see such small dimensions and uh, they manipulated tiny DNA strands. To even consider this as a possibility, we need actual physical evidence that ancient Indians understood and used nanotechnology. But surprisingly, such an evidence has emerged from an ancient archaeological site called Kiradi in South India. Even by conservative estimate, this site is at least 2,600 years old. And what archaeologists have found here has baffled all experts. The carbon tubes found here show that ancient people were able to synthesize carbon structures accurately to less than one nanometer. This is smaller than the diameter of a DNA strand. Experts confirm that yes, they have used nanotechnology at least 2,600 years ago. So we have actual physical evidence proving that ancient Indians had the capability to process and manipulate something as small as DNA. Today, we collect DNA samples and use a machine called centrifuge. In simpler terms, we need to rotate DNA samples at high speed. Why? Because the weight of DNA is lesser than the rest of the cell material. So by spinning the sample with centrifuge, we can separate the DNA alone. This is the essential process before analyzing it. Now, bioengineers from Stanford have developed a handheld centrifuge where you can place multiple vials and rotate them at high speed. You don't even need electricity to centrifuge samples in this handheld device. But did ancient Indians also use the same centrifuge technology? Here's a man holding a circular device. Around it, there are multiple slots to hold various samples. Even more interesting, the man appears to be looking at his wristwatch as though he's timing the centrifuge process, just like how we use a timer today. Are all these carvings mere coincidences or were ancient people involved in genetic modification and DNA manipulation? Now, I've shown you evidence after evidence from ancient carvings, ancient texts, archaeological artifacts, age-old rituals, etc. You can tell that I gathered this information after visiting many, many ancient sites and uh, researching for many years. But let's say I'm wrong about 25% of this. Let's say I misunderstood 25% of this stuff. Actually, let's inverse that. Like, let's even claim that I'm wrong 75%, and only 25% of this information is accurate. But even that is very big. The evidences I've shown you, even if 25% is accurate, that actually proves that there was very advanced technology during ancient times. We have to admit that what we read in history books is not the whole picture. And there's a huge chunk of ancient history that's deliberately hidden from us. I hope you like this video. I am Praveen Mohan. Thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and please give it a thumbs up and do share it with your friends. And I will talk to you soon.